Game number one, we are in group B of the playoffs, the group stage, everybody. We have the Cats against the Svenska. So this is the same group that we find the Enjoyers in and also the Raiders. The Raiders have already claimed victory and are now waiting in the winner's match. It's the best of three series that we have here. The top two out of the group of four move on to the next and final round of the Banshee Cup and play then for the $2,000 of prize money that is split onto the top four teams. But there's more money around that the teams can pick up for themselves and that is in form of bounties. We announced the twist already a bit earlier, but just to give you guys a bit of an idea, so we have all of the bounties that you can see on screen right now and bounties are completely voluntarily so the teams don't have to do any of this they are not they, they really can just pick and choose if they want to play with a bounty fantastic if they say nah we don't think we can win with those handicaps what we would like to do instead is we would just like try and go for the prize money they can as well so the maximum payout if teams complete bounties throughout the games would be three thousand and six hundred dollars for the tournament and bounties work pretty easily you see all of the bounties listed here each team can complete one bounty per match, not more than one, one is the maximum, and the bounty board applies to each team individually. So if one team completes the Nova bounty, they cannot complete the same bounty again in subsequent matches, but any other team that hasn't played with Nova yet can still do that. For each and every bounty that gets completed, the team gets additional $50. Now, <laughs> Chogal gets already banned, so the Svenska, it's actually funny, because it is something, if you were going to see a Chogal, there's a good chance that it's going to happen from the cats, and now that they're even incentivized to do, more to do it, uh, because of the bounty board, Chogal gets banned immediately, the Svenskas just say no, thank you very much. We have a couple of subs playing in today on uh, the side of the Svenskas. Jean Lasalle is playing here and Cure is playing for them too. Now, the one player that I'm missing on the side of the Svenskas is Svam Grotta. Why is Svam Grotta? Pretty easy because he is the, the resident murky enthusiast. So he could be the one opting for a murky bounty. Maybe this is also the reason why he's not playing. Maybe the team saw the bounty board, they saw the murky bounty and they're like, okay. We gotta kick Svam Grotta off the team for the playoffs because if not, he's going to just hound ass game after game to play Murky. Yeah, we'll see what they do. There's a couple of team bounties as well, and with Diablo being picked, we're gonna keep an eye on that because there is a pretty solid Diablo only team that you can play. Leo being picked away throws a little bit of a wrench into plans, but since this is Infernal Shrines and Sonya is also very strong here, you have another great side laner that could be played out of the Diablo universe. But it comes down what the Svenskas are going to play. If they're locking in Vala, for example, and then, I don't know, go for Deckard Kane, then you definitely have an idea of what potentially could be played by them. But they go Brightwing. Ruin all the plans. All hopes and dreams out the window. And we get Genji. And again, bounties are optional. Bounties are essentially something where you can give yourself an extra handicap if you think, okay, we can win this. We can develop a cheese around a certain strategy, and then we can make that happen. Also, this is the first time that we're using uh, the bounty board. There might be in the future additional bounties that we're adding in other tournaments. There might also be some adjustments to the system in general. Uh, there was always already a suggestion, I mean, we've thought of, obviously about it too, of making certain incentives a little bit bigger, looking at the bounty, for example, and thinking like, hey, okay, this is very difficult. So instead of $50, if you complete it, you get 75, you get 100, something like that. But in order to do any of this, we just need some data with the first tournament, and then we'll see, you know, where things go. How do the players uh, receive all of this? How does the audience like it? Which bounties get played? Which bounties don't get played? And what's maybe too easy, what's too hard? So there's a lot of adjustments that can be made in the future, but this is definitely going to help with a lot of it. We had teams try and complete bounties. Some are just completely letting it go and ignoring it. Others have went for it. The uh, Bratwurst boys are the only ones that have so far successfully completed a bounty. They played a game with no healer and were able to win it, only relying on Abatha as a bit of support with shield. Muradin comes in and we get Stukov, the man with a big arm. Uh, okay. So Stormbolt into Lurking Arm, a little bit of AoE from Soaking from the Cats. And Gia plus Max Passion. Mm -hmm. What's gonna be for the last two? What are we gonna get for the side lane? Are they gonna go for Sonya here for a bit of spin to win action? And what's the second damage dealer? Is it Mage Time? 
game number two. Well, it's Tychus and Blaze. Yeah, Blaze is still up as well, so he obviously qualifies. And we get the Odin transformation. Alrighty. Good old Tychus. Yeah, makes an appearance again. Good for him. That leaves us with only Drakia as the final pick for map number one in the best of three series. What do the cats have up their sleeves? We have already Hanzo. Here comes Mephisto, so they go for the mage. And with that, we're heading straight into Infernal Shrines. Cats against the Svenskas! Game number one, we are on Infernal Shrines, ladies and gentlemen. And it is time to party! Which team takes the lead in the best of three series? Which team starts to make some moves towards that winner's match where we currently have... Of course, already one team waiting, and that would be the winner of the previous match. That would be the Raiders. Soaking now on the blue team with Leoric, Dark Reader on Mephisto. We have Irath on Hanzo, Cascon on Merlin, Captain Rex on Stukov, and on the right side, the Svenskas with Gia on Genji, Jean Lassalle on Brightwing, Cure is playing Blaze, subbing in as is Jean. We got Skook on Diablo and Max Passion on Tigers. So, let the games begin. Uh, Cure playing cross server, of course, so a bit of a ping disadvantage for him. As so often, he finds himself on the side lane. It is pretty much. I don't want to say it's exclusively what he's playing for the teams when he's playing cross server. He's been playing actually a bit of Zeratul and other stuff as well. But obviously, when you're playing with a slight ping disadvantage, it makes things more difficult. And one of the things that they are doing here in order to adjust accordingly is put him on the side lane, which can be a little bit more forgiving since if you get caught, you still have your bunker up, you have a bit more hit points, and you're playing a squishy melee assassin or anything uh, like that. But okay, we have up at the top. Already our 1v1 now established with Soaking and with Cure in the middle. A bit of a fight happening and it could actually be the end of Diablo if he's not careful. Damn, he's getting bodied hard. <laughs> that Ragdoll gets kicked to the top. They counter... No, not the counter kill. They're getting a second. They're going for Brightwing and taking the Fruit Fly out as well. Off to a great start here. Blue team, the Cats with a double kill. And attempting now to steal the opponent's camp away too. So, not too bad. Pretty solid start into the game from them. Hmm. And the question still remaining. What else are they going to be able to do with that little lead? They have a one, little one level advantage. They can take another camp. They might even get all three of them from the looks of it. And we all know what is highly important when you're playing on this map. I mean, one of the most important things, honestly, is that you are starting things off with an advantage for the first objective. You want to get that level 7 talent faster than your opponent does, and then you can have your plays. So... Over on uh, the right side, uh, the Svenskas are playing this a bit passive. They have now the bigger they are in with level 4 talents, of course. But, hmm. It's a great start for the Cats. Now, both teams are playing with some subs. But time will tell what they can do here. I mean, Cascor is already moving around with Muradin. Hoping for another Stormbolt setup, and that half level lead that they're holding, that translates directly into an early level 7 for Shrine number 1, which is spawning at the bottom of the map. If they can do a bit more, then hey, even better. But they also picked off three of the camps, so all three of the Kazra camps went to uh, the Cats. The Svenskas, they have to try and bridge that gap quickly. As, uh, well... There's no real global there. Brightwing isn't a real global. Brightwing is, uh, is yeah, something. Doesn't have the wave clear. Consider the top lane a little bit long in order to get some extra experience, but again, doesn't have the same wave clear as, let's say, the Haka falls that. So that's already making a big difference here. And since they know that the blue team uh, uh, is at, on at the bottom of the map, the wall gets broken through. They're even catching Max Passion. Uh, yeah, Max Passion and Max Dead. So, they, wow. What a shitty start into this game. Holy cow. Three kills to zero. We have level 7 talents now for both teams. They're at least trying to get some value at the bot lane, but the Mortar Punisher has already claimed. And this is just hurting. Bottom wall got destroyed, so the Punisher can go directly for the fort. They're trying to trap him here. Which isn't bad, but they are aiming for Muradin, and Kaskor gets out for a moment, but gets still killed. 
The problem with all of this is, yes, you kill Muradin, but you're also losing your bottom fort. <laughs> it means that you don't have anybody there that can currently defend for you. So the fort is gone. That's the first one fallen. Four minutes in. They got a kill as a result, which isn't bad, but again... Yeah. This is a tricky start. I have the feeling that the Svenskars are not quite awake yet. Problem in Sweden is it's just too cold. I talked to a couple of friends in Finland the other day and they told me that they expect the snow to be gone in May. <laughs> I was just sitting there like, what, May? <laughs> like, we have 20, 20 to 23 degrees in, uh, in Spain right now and you're talking about the snow being gone in May? <laughs> I was like, what? I, I, to the, to, I mean, I still hope that they misspoke and they meant March. But it's just bonkers to me. So I think they're just still going full sloth mode. Go, uh, they're, they're still in hibernation. The Swedes, they need a game or two until they're probably properly waking up and until they're good to go here. That's what, that's what I personally think. Now, either way, level 9 to level 9. One fort, as I said, is gone. Three kills to two. And yeah, they got four Diablo now also malevolence. We got Tychus with the soldier. Oh, Diablo! Yeah, even with Brightwing, that might be the end of him. If Murden connects another Stormbolt here, that is the end. And Skog is dead. Gets Hanzo there towards the end. Now level 10 abilities are ready. And I gotta give him at least some credit. I mean, they have level 10 in a moment, so despite the fact that what happened here throughout the entire game, they haven't fallen too far behind. Now we have the Apocalypse out, and Stukov got completely caught by the Entomb. Not in the Entomb, but he got completely zoned out by the Entomb. And that worked well to finally take aim and take him down. Soaking is also dead, so they are slowly waking up here. Yep, seems like they're slowly starting to uh, get into a flow. Four kills to four. And let's see if they can now slowly bring this one back, because they are ahead in experience now. But they need to do a lot more if they want to be successful on this one. Yeah, there needs to be a lot more than happen that happens here if they want to have a chance. Uh, we'll see. Now, down at the bottom of the map, there's still a couple of camps, of course, up. And now that the Swedish team is finally starting to get into the rhythm, they're hoping for uh, Drak here. Uh, good damage, not quite a kill. Nurden is now jumping in deep and is applying some pressure on the Tigers. Hits the Stormbolt straight into Diablo's face, on the other hand. But they got a retreat now as well. So, yeah, slowly and steadily, things are coming together for them. Now, the next shrine is about to get activated. This time we're talking about the middle of the map. We're talking about mid lane. And it's a much, much better position now for the Swedish team. They've still lost their bottom fort. They've lost some hit points on the fort in the middle of the map. But they have a fountain there. They can still fight for the objective. And on top of that, they also have the exact same level as the opponent. The same talent here. They have also Odin, which is oftentimes when you're playing Tyker, is just absolutely crucial playing on this map. There's teams that even with uh, Tyker's give up on uh, the first objective just in order to uh, make some of this happen and then wait for the second one so that they can use Odin. It's just a powerful tool on the shrine. But here comes the attack. Yeah. Blaze is missing. So they're fighting a 4 versus 5 at this point. And the position on the shrine has now been taken by the blue team. They take a slight lead on... Sh oh, nice! The Apocalypse connects! Connects after the jet propulsion. A wall stun. Muradin gets bullied and the grenade to the face finishes the job. Nice! That's the kill that they needed, that's the kill that they got, and now they have full control. They are behind on Shrine Minions for now, but this is exactly where they can turn things around now. Leo dead it as well, topside Genji is still playing it out and hoping to escort the camp a bit further in. Captain Rex is attempting to defend. Blaze has already moved down to the bottom of the map to catch more experience for them. But over here, they hold control of the shrine with an iron fist and they are going to claim this one. So, yep, job well done. Punisher for the Swedish team. 13 on both sides. Definitely a neat play now from uh, the Swedes. Now, we have the virulent reaction now taken. So, they're continuing with the plays. And, well, they hope to take the fort out in the middle. Now, they have two forts that they can aim for. The one at the top is on half HP, and the one in the middle gets now attacked by the mod, uh, sorry, by the Arcane Punisher. Uh, but Genji, they're coming in with him and with Tychus. And they're going for Leo. So Leo goes down, Genji's still up here at the top. 
in the middle. The wall is being broken through. Cure is still doing his thing. And then on top of that, they are, of course, also looking uh, towards the fort that I've been talking about a moment ago. Can score with Mirrodin. They're still trying. I mean, the cats are really just coming in here, doing their best. Soaking is respawning with Leoric. Apocalypse, more for zoning than anything else. If you really wanted to make a proper approach, then uh, it was a little bit too late to the party there. But they are still making some moves now for the middle. It's a fairly even game at this point. The early start was more leaning towards the blue team, but right now things are starting to stabilize. Still a structural advantage. Nice flip into the jet propulsion from Diablo. Good coordination with Cure, and it helps them nearly to get a kill. They barely missed out on that. And Genji is still hoping that he can uh, get that kill at the top on the fort. He is going to push this lane out over and over again if he gets a chance. They're making another move for Leo and soaking. Yeah, he's gone again, isn't he? Brightwing moves in with a poly and that's the end of Leori. Leoric. Leorgi, he's going full Leorgi. Soaking is going full Orky on this one. That's five kills against him already. So that's more than half. More than half the deaths of the blue team uh, that are on his end right now. So, yeah, definitely not what he was looking for here. But that means four versus five for the next few seconds for the cats. And they're already starting to go for more middle pressure. The level 16 talents are now available. And despite the fact that we haven't seen a single structure destroyed on uh, the side of the uh, blue team, the red team has taken a solid lead in experience. They are now on level 16 talents. They are more than a level ahead of their opponents and they are controlling the middle of the map fairly easily at this point. So they're doing all the all the right things right now, making the big plays in order to get the camps, in order to take every single mercenary camp that spawns. And they can also force and fight some of these fights if they really wanted to. Just need to make sure they got enough heroes around. Currently they're still missing Genji who's coming back in the middle after hearthing initially here. Yeah, but the attacks they still keep coming. And with level 16, we now also have them uh, with Tigers with the armored piercing rounds. We got the final cut again from Genji. Bit of a fight in the middle as they're going for uh, soaking. Uh, yeah, nearly got him again. That would have been the sixth time. And Genji has maybe not even given up on this yet. Genji is looking like he wants to go for another round. They go for Stuko first and drop him. Even the bunker couldn't save him. Oh, and there's another play. There's Leo getting destroyed, so that is kill number two in this fight. Stukov and Leo both dead, and this is the chance to take the fort out. This is also a shrine that activates in three seconds. So yep, more and more hits keep coming against the cats. that are getting doused in water over here, and cats don't like that whatsoever. So yep, they are just trying to get out. And these are big hits. Ten kills now against four. They definitely walk up. <laughs> they injected some coffee or something. Whatever they did, it clearly worked. Now they're back on track and back to the usual coordination that we're getting from them. That was maybe a bit weird initially, but yeah, here they go. So the fort at the top gets destroyed. They have taken the lead on the shrine. They are looking for another kill and Casco is dead. So is Leoric. The front line is gone. The fort in the middle is exposed. So is the shrine. So yeah, they're hitting all... They're hitting everything here. They absolutely do. They're going for all the big hits, moving in to take the objective, pushing this out in the middle a bit further. Still not poking this as aggressively as I expected them to. But again, they're making their moves and it is heavily hurting the blue team. Blue team is trying what they can, but it is tough going for them right now. At least they have level 16. So they came back with level 16 talents. But you can tell that they're even delaying the objective a little bit, sitting at 39 stacks now. And just like delaying this slightly, pressuring more on the top side after they took the camp. So they are attempting to push at the bottom of the map and force some of the blue team heroes to the top in order to deal with uh, the camp or it will go straight for uh, the, uh, the keep wall. So a nice double pronged attack that they are looking for right now. And this should do damage. I mean, it will do damage. Blue team is attempting to force their hand, so the whole thing is they just move on the shrine, force their hand here, but they're also getting forced into a fight, and that's not one they can likely win. 
Stukov goes down and they might lose more than that because Kaskor is the next target. Tykes has to use his ult as Mephisto is trying to go for him. But as Leoric is still up at the top and attempting to defend, they got mirrored in with Brightwing and Genji and they're pushing through the bottom of the map to take the fort out. Genji is now going to deal with the one in the middle finally. So yes, structures are lost all over the place all of a sudden. They're losing ground by the second. Level 20 is available too. Another reason why they delayed the objective. They are doing all the right uh, plays now. And they get another kill. Absolute disaster. Total disaster for them. They're losing Hanzo. They're losing Leoric. And this seems like it is going to be game. This is not only a keep that gets destroyed here. They're going for the game and glory. 17 kills to 4. 3 level advantage. Absolute brutal display in the final minutes of game number one. Infernal Shrines goes over to the red team as the Svenskas take the W on the first map of the best of three series here in Group B of the playoffs. GG. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Game number two, Cursed Hollow. The Svenskas have taken the lead. Big victory on Infernal Shrines. Extremely well coordinated last fight. First of all, delaying the objective to take the camp at the top, apply more pressure to the top lane to get themselves more experience and closer to level 20, and then just syncing it up perfectly with the attack. Have a level 20 with a Punisher and also top lane pressure and with the kills that they locked in, they could go straight for the core. So now we're heading into game number two of the best of three series. Again, we are in the first round of the group stage. So the winner moves on to the winner's match. The loser moves on to the loser's match. And at this point, it's going to be interesting to see if one of the teams locks in uh, bounty or not. Again, all optional. If they feel that they have a gap here, then they could definitely do it. So, we got Sylvanas and we got already Lucio banned out. Also, I can give you guys a quick glimpse again at the list of bounties so they can just refresh your memory real, real quickly as the bans come through. Now, I personally expect that most of these are going to be played out, let's say, on the second map in the best of three. But since we have still the same rule that you can only play hero once within a single series, the drafts get a little bit more limited as you're moving into game number three and game number four, or potential game number five, as we're heading into the final weekend and the finals. So I would assume that most of the team bounties you're probably looking for map number two, and a lot of the other bounties are going to happen when we are in the uh, in game number four or something along those lines. So yeah, that's something. But again, all speculation. For the teams, it's just an incentive. If they feel they have a chance to do that, they're free to do it. But at no point is this something that they're forced to do. For me personally, it's more something that I could see teams also do that know they are unlikely to make it into the top four, for example. There's always teams that make it into the top eight and then they're struggling to get into the top four, the top three, where they fight for the actual prize money. And I think for them, it's more of an incentive to really work on some of the cheeses and some of the cheeky plays and try and just win a map. If they then can also win the entire series, is of course great. But for some of those lower teams that usually end up in number eight, seven, six, this might be a cool thing to get at least a little bit of pizza money for the team so that not all the money is all the way up at the top. So, yeah. Well, Junkrat, Anubarak, and Rega are now in. Okay. Yeah, Jean Lasalle with Rega here for Cursed Hollow. Cursed Hollow, I mean, I'm gonna. Ah! Ha ha ha! There it is! Shogal! Shogal for the cats, everybody! Nice! Very, very nice. Okay. So, now we have a bounty attempt, and it's this is exactly the team that you expect to go for the Chogal bounty. They've played so much Chogal already. I mean, Chogal was literally banned against them on the first map that they are known for it. So, we'll see what we're going to do with that. So, kind of nice. I really like that. <laughs> the Vikings get banned. Yeah, I don't want to... I mean, Chogal, basically you play one here instead of two, and then if the Vikings make up the numbers again, then you have also the control over the map itself as Chogal goes big. So, let's see what they're doing. 
Uh, by the way, just as a bit of a side note, in case it ever comes up, you can only complete a bounty per match. This means even if a team plays two potential bounties, only one counts. They have to decide at the end of the match then what they're doing. So uh, let's say somebody plays Murky Octograp with Nova Precision Strike. Unlikely, but it could happen. If it does, that's a single bounty. So you can't all of a sudden just like complete two. Well, how are they countering Choga now? Greyman is out. Sylvanas has been uh, also banned away, so they can't just simply push the lanes down. Tigers has been played. Malthel is, of course, still available, so they can play with him. And they get Li Ming for some extra burst damage. So they can poke that out there, too. <laughs> so, yeah, I kind of like it. All right, there comes the double pick. The final one, Moment of Truth. What support are they going to go for with this? Oriel, Alexstrasza, all good ones. They want to get Life Binder in, for example. Uh, and they need also a bit more side lane. Samuro, and we're going potions. We go Deckard Kane. So Samuro on the side. And we have Deckard Kane on top of that as Gia is the final pick for the team. Yeah, we need another damage dealer. Could also be another melee hero, of course, if they're really looking at just Chogal damage. You could go Thrall and then go level 16 for the added damage. I mean, Vala is up, but they decided to go the route with Li Ming, so it's a bit unlikely that they're now all of a sudden switching tactics and going into Vala with auto attacks. They are playing Illidan. They, they, we are seeing so much Illidan right now. It's actually really funny to me. It's super interesting. Curse Solo, game number two. Let's go, everybody. Let's see if the Cats win this one, if they can complete a bounty and force game number three, or if the Svenskars are taking a 2-0 victory. Cats against Svenskas, Soaking against Samuro. <laughs> Hopefully not. Soaking is playing Samuro. <laughs> the Svenskas are playing against Samuro. If Soaking would play against Samuro, that would be pretty rough. Captain Rex is playing Dagat Kane. We have Hirath on Cho, Dark Reader on Gal, and Kaskor is playing Junkrat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It would be kind of funny if you had to fight with your hero. The hero fights against you. There's a new concept. G on Illidan for the Svenskas. We got Max Passion on Malthael. Jean Lasalle on Rega. Cure on Li Ming. And Skook is playing a Nubarak. So, let's go. Already the attack down at the bottom of the map. We got Hirida doing his thing. It would be so funny to me if they would be able to complete the bounty here and really win this because, again, they are the ones that play Chogal in the first place. This is this is the cool thing. You have certain teams that already like to play certain niche heroes and now they're incentivized even further to do exactly that. So it's kind of cool to just be in the spot where for a team like the, the, the Cats, they have a higher incentive to play with Chogal here. Now, can they win with him? That's a totally different story, but they are at least looking at a spot where like, okay, not only do we get to play a hero that we already like in the first place, but if we actually win a game with him, we get an additional pri oh, bo bo bo. additional boost to price and pizza money. So, already he's able to get away here. We got now on level 1 the unending hatred also for Illidan. And yeah, as I said before, this is the second time now that we actually get Illidan. Which I personally like. We've been even thinking about putting a potential bounty on Illidan, but it seems that's not needed because our boy sees play. Gia now at the top. Let's see what they can do. They can, I mean, he can, of course, easily take also structures down. Once that he is starting to stack up his level 1 a little bit more, that's a lot of single target damage that he can get in. And he can go for structures and take them out very quickly. There's something that Rich taught the Western scene a lot when he all of a sudden started to pick Illidan in the days of HGC and just destroyed structure after structure. And all the Europeans were looking at him and like, um, okay, kind of need to adjust to that. That was the beauty of most of the international plays, honestly. That you had the different metas collide and clash and everybody had to figure out what works, what doesn't. What works on your own server and region doesn't necessarily work in the international environment. That's one of the reasons why it was so cool to have the Nations Cup last year. And again, if you haven't watched it yet, you should check out that playlist on uh, my YouTube channel. Because that was pretty epic. Koreans, North Americans and Europeans fighting the regional battle again. And yeah, colliding pretty heavily there. So that was epic event. Absolutely epic offline event. Now, all the way up at the top, Illidan still against Samuro. We've seen the exact same play already once in Group A. 
those two going toe to toe. Back then it was with a bit of extra Abatha support, which already <laughs> shifted things heavily in favor of Samura, of course. This time he can't rely on that. Down at the bottom of the map. Whoa! Kaskor going from main tank play straight into Junkrat. Now that Shogal has taken over and he nearly became first blood in game number two. But we still have them with Cho now with Seared Flesh and the Colors Tide. And Gal with We See You and the Rising Dread. Now I got news for you, I see all of you. I can see everything. The beauty of being an observer. So, first blood, who gets it? And who gets the first tribute? First one isn't play now. Cure on Liming. It's also kind of wild. Not something that I see him on all that often. Now, it's always a bit of a question, of course, what can he play on the European server playing cross server, playing with a ping disadvantage. Ah, there's the kill. Malthael. The aspect of death gets deaded, or the angel of death. So, yep, kill is in. And Illidan is at 10 stacks now. He's actually rotating between the lanes, trying to make all of this happen a little bit faster for himself and get that st uh, those stacks in. But also having with Unbound right now. So another tool that gives him some added mobility as well. And yeah, in we go. The bot lane pressure has paid off. The wall is gone. It's gotten completely destroyed and they are looking great here. They're looking very good. So they're getting the wall destroyed. They're applying more pressure on the first four. Chogal is still totally fine there, but now they're really throwing everything against them. I mean, Li Ming is coming in, misses the combo, but still gets some damage out with Calamity against Deckard Kane. So Captain Rex now has to be cautious, but they are doing massive amounts of damage down here. And the Junkrat is in the middle of the map trying to break the wall down as well. Chogal is still totally fine. So they're making great moves in an attempt to uh, just, yeah, push back against the blue team, or against the red team that gave them a lot of trouble in game number one. Illidan. Oh, a bit low, Gia. Yeah, and he gets out. That one was clutch. I mean, he nearly died there. So still struggling a bit in this encounter, in this 1v1. One kill to zero. The tribute is still up. We're five minutes in and nobody has taken the first tribute yet. I mean, nobody has made a move on that yet. Whereas down here, Chogal is just doing his, his thing. Yeah, and up at the top, Illidan is still suffering a bit. He needs more uh, auto attack damage on his level 1 so that he can make the big plays and also get his own sustain going. That will happen sooner rather than later. Five more and he is going to get the quest reward on level 1 and can of course stack past that. Level 10 abilities are coming in. The wall gets opened up as Li Ming is starting to hammer them out. Max Passion is in max trouble and dies. So he is gone, potions are still coming, and Anubarak decides that this is a pretty do stupid idea to go up against Shogal and try and go for the counter kill. So that's two kills to zero, and the cats are in the lead. <laughs> yeah, the cats are slowly starting to pull ahead here. They're making the moves. Shogal too strong. Hunt for Illidan, and the first tribute is now finally being taken as Li Ming at least gets Junkrat destroyed in the middle. But yes, Illidan has the hunt. We have Bladestorm as usual for, uh, for, for Soaking, his favorite talent there. And Illidan is starting to work the top a bit, takes the tower down, escorts the minions in again. Down at the bottom, they're even going for uh, the boss now. <laughs> Shogal against Illidan. <laughs> it's a party. I like it. Uh, it's a fun one. Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, right now, what we're getting is just great entertainment. And as each team goes for a boss, we now have the one at the top already taken, easily claimed. Down at the bottom of the map is obviously going to happen too. Two kills to one, one fort destroyed. It's only the red team that has lost a fort thus far. But this is definitely not going to be the last. And after the triple got finally claimed, the second one is about to spawn at the top. Bit of a better position for the red team. More over to their side. And yeah, Soaking has to move back here. Illidan is still working this out. And are they even interrupting? Yeah, I think they're at least going to try and delay it a little bit. Boss also at the bot lane that needs some attention. And they're moving in for it as we speak. Nubarak trying to control the spot a little bit. Uh, not going to be too much that he can do here for now. But Illidan is coming in. And my man is starting to go for it. Ah, look at those auto attacks. They don't have tons of stun. This is one of the big advantages of Illidan in this setup. 
There's not a lot of stun available, not a lot of hard stun available for the blue team. So this is where Illidan thrives. There's a few things you can do against him, of course, now, and displacement is one. But Liming goes, so does Deckard Kane, Rega, oi, and he gets away. Gia is also dashing out of the fight. They're trading blows, they're trading kills. The boss at the top has been defeated. The one at the bottom of the map is still doing some work and even the keep is taking some damage. Now it's not going to take a lot of damage, but even a little bit already counts here. And Illidan is still stacking. He's still stacking his level 1 and this is not going to get any easier for the blue team as the game continues. So while Chogal is currently dominating things and is normally a hero that thrives in the late game and can absolutely murder people, I'm still curious to see what he can do later on when Illidan is really unleashing his full potential since there are no hard stuns available. There's a couple of CC tools that the blue team has, but normally what you want to do against Illidan is really establish a CC chain. Get a Stormbolt going, uh, Imperius lunge as a follow-up, Stukov, no matter what it is, you need to do something. We also have for this game with Li Ming, with Cure going super ballsy here. I mean, again, playing with... Oh, there's the hunt! And Chogal gets cocooned. That's the Walmart special right there. Two to the price of one. One cooldown and you drop two heroes with it. So cocoon, nicely done. Yeah, Rega dead. Deckard Kane is also gone. Both of the supports are eliminated. Li Ming, what I wanted to say, went straight into glass cannon. So Cure playing this a bit risky, but also potential big reward for him. We have Samora at the top getting another tribute, and that's a curse. The red team is now cursed. They didn't pay attention to what was happening topside. or well, were absolutely happy to let it go, as it seems. Didn't really win the fight either, because it was only an exchange in supports that happened, uh, essentially. But now we have four kills to three, a level lead for the blue team and the cats. While they're being chased, they'll find themselves in a decent spot. They made an adjustment, of course, with Molten Block at level 13, because we have uh, Malthael with last rights. So that's definitely something that you have to be careful about when you're playing Chogal. You can't lose him that easily. 13 talents kicking in for both sides. I have been kicking in for both sides a while ago, but now level 16 for the blue team and all the pressure that they're establishing. They are in a position where they can easily start to take on the opponent's uh, keeps. The forts are all gone. For Illidan, that means that distance to safety is going to be extended. So once that these fights turn, uh, he might be able to chase, but that doesn't mean that they're easily going to be able to win it. 52 order attack now for Illidan on level 1, so yes, that makes a lot of things easier for him. But we'll see. There's a lot of damage done, and look at this, I mean, even the keep is taking damage. They didn't even stop at the forts. They are going for the keeps now as well, so damage all over the place. And this is starting to become a little bit of a concern for the red team. Again, there's a bounty in play here. It's not only for the W, there's also a bounty in play, and the cats are pretty confident, I would say, that they can pull that one off. They love to play with Chogal, they showed it in the past, and this is the reason why Chogal gets banned out against them time and time again. So, well, as it continues, what can they do from here on out? Red team, talking about them. They have even talents now, still a level behind. They lost every single fort, so they lost a lot of ground on the map and have to try and reclaim that somehow. They need some kills and in an ideal world they would try to take Chogal down. 27,000 damage from Arthael. Cho has 38k, he's top damage, even ahead of Gal. I guess we finally established who the more important one is. Gal is sitting at 35,000. Yeah, and the bosses are back up on the map. So, the place can now be made. And Illidan is still stacking. Gia pausing the game. Illidan is still stacking. He rides into battle with the money of the... Uh, with the power of the money pick. <laughs> with the money of the power pick. <laughs> I need another coffee. <laughs> now it's the money of the power pick. Earlier it was Samuro that was battling against uh, Soaking. So, yes, I definitely need another coffee. <laughs> One was not enough as it seems. So I'm not quite sure if anybody dropped here for them. Uh, sometimes when Q is subbing in, he has a few ping issues. So it could be that that is a concern that they're currently having and something that they need to deal with and fix. But yeah, either way, they are in a spot where they have to step it up. We have Illidan, of course, getting his stacks together and scaling into the late game. So that's good for them. But Shogal has already done a lot of damage. It's not only the battles that they've been winning, but it's honestly more important the way that they've been able to control the entire map and starting to take out forts. With the bottom wall at the key, opened up 
the one in the middle essentially as well i mean a lot of this is already gone they have vision through it they can easily approach it and then at the top side also this one opening up with the keep also being damaged there's not a lot that you can allow for now there's not a single tribute towards the red team which is another problem bosses are up so once that they're taken we're talking keeps this is a dicey spot. I mean, this is uh, pretty uncomfortable for them. So, Chogal again, cocooned. And here comes the hunt. We get a quick stun, the follow up, and bam. Goodbye, Deckard Kane. The hunt plays from Illidan, definitely sweet. But Samuro takes out Liming. She has glass cannon, super vulnerable here. Now they're trying for <laughs> Illidan, and he nearly died. <laughs> Illidan nearly died. He's still alive, but only thanks to Rega was able to give him an ancestral just in the nick of time. I mean, Illidan was literally pinned down into a corner, so was able to move away, but that ancestral was still heavily needed. They're moving in for the boss, as it seems. Problem is that the same is also happening down at the bottom of the map in a second, and there's another tribute that can now be taken, and this is going to be the... Uh, fourth tribute in a row for them four tributes in a row and it's already annoying because well there's a catapult marching towards the core they have sent cure to deal with it as he respawns the top side boss is about to be taken now it's a bit of a wild game they got kane has died three times he is the prime target they're hunting on him time and time again so yeah quite nasty but six kills to four and it's also level 20 that's starting to worry me a bit uh, for the Spenskars. For the Cats, that's great, because that is a solid lead. And they are trying to chase Illidor, I guess. <laughs> yeah, they were waiting for him. But Gia is still able to get out. <laughs> oh, yeah, they really want him. <laughs> Superman! An immediate move into the middle. Had to use the hunt here. They really were trying to pin him down as quickly as possible. So down here, the keep is taking damage. They're still saving it. Each team got one boss, so they're doing some work. Shogal is dealing with the boss at the top. And this one is not even breaking through the wall. So, yeah. Half a level until 20. Illidan, 58, uh, 58 uh, extra damage on his level 1. 24,000 damage, guys. It's actually not bad. I mean, Illidan is usually not the one that walks away with the most uh, with the most hero damage here, but his single target damage right now is not too shabby. And as the game continues, he can pad those stats a little bit more. 44,000 still for Cho. Gal with 42k. Can they get the bounty? I mean, again, it's about the next tribute. Four have been going over to the cats. They already got a curse. And the Svenskas, this would be their first. And this time they grab it. Okay, this time they get it. Here are the level 20 talents just to... Oh, cure! <laughs> oh, the damage! Samuro is absolutely murdering Li Ming with that glass cannon play that we've seen there. Blade Master's Pursuit is now in as well. That's bad news for uh, Li Ming. And we've seen this before. <laughs> Shogun on structures in the late game is more than ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. He's willing to die. Look at this. They went into Hour of Twilight with the decrease of the death timer. And they're going to just do this a few times this game. This is something that they have done in the past. The death timer is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous once that you have that talent. So Hour of Twilight is crazy. And it allows them to just suicide with Chogal onto structures. And they think that this is the play that will win them the game. So it might be. It honestly might be. Tribute at the top can uh, maybe be locked in, but there is counter pressure. The Svenskas are using the chance after Chogal has been eliminated to take the fort out. Now, this is good news for Svenska fans. The bad news is, once that it's not about forts anymore, but about keeps, this is a lot more dangerous. Because you have to cross the entire map, Chogal is going to respawn more or less in time to defend, and then they can go up again. So, this is going to be an interesting play now. Chogal can YOLO onto keeps and core. And he is going to make that work. They've done it before. More than once. So getting those level 20 talents for Chogal is big. And again, I've also been talking about Samuro a bit. He's at 41,000 damage. You've seen how quickly he charges onto uh, Li Ming and takes her out. So yeah, there's the Ancestral. They have to sacrifice the Ancestral very much immediately because Q has Glass Cannon. Q has Glass Cannon and again, you're a Glass Cannon. <laughs> so you get hit by anything and you're just getting wrecked. Chogal is going to try and aim for him. Samuro is trying to aim for him. So they're all going to try to do exactly that. 
And guess what? A man on a mission. Cocoon is in. I still think he's gonna get the keep. He's gonna get stunned. There's the combo. Ah, does he get anything out? Yep, he gets the keep. Keep's gone. <laughs> That's all that they wanted. That's all that they needed. Yep. So Choga commits Sudoku once again and the keep is gone. They can now move into the middle and take the fort. So the fort, you can potentially take it now. But not more than that. You're not gonna get a keep. You, you can't get a keep because Choga is back in 15 seconds already. Even the fort might be questionable now that we have the camp lined up perfectly. So, <laughs> yeah. They're trying to flank in though. Cure is already sitting tight. The next bad news is that the cats have two tributes again. Two tributes already. The next one is spawning. If they can interrupt that, then maybe they can get another curse onto the red team. Shogal is moving in. Ah, it's a trap, but they figured it out. Yeah. There's the interrupt attempt, but it came too late. So it's two tributes to two. The next one is going to spawn a curse. So the next one is going to give a curse to one team. <laughs> it's awesome. Oh, it's great. So, yeah. Here we go. Shogal gets cocooned again. And, well, in the meantime, the push out at the bottom of the map. I mean, top side. Oh, soaking! Oh, he's soaking all the damage. Can they get a counter kill? Maybe Illidan? Nah, Illidan seems like he's gonna be fine here. And Illidan is by now on 72 stacks for his level 1. Okay, once again the attack. Ancestral came in. Gascor wants to get away. And they aim for Illidan. They're just trying to save the, the game right now. Because now with the with Samuro gone, this is a problem. And Samuro obviously doesn't really have the advantage of Chogal being back in only half the death timer. So they come in with a rip tire, try and blow them up, and oof, that was a lot of damage on Illidan. They might have to let this one go. Are they trying to take it? Guys, you're still playing a 3 versus 5. <laughs> I would be a bit careful with that. <laughs> Samuro is not back. Damn, that's ballsy. Seriously? There's a kill? Who takes it? Jogal is dead. That was so dumb. Like, why? <laughs> okay, that was pretty stupid, I think. You have, th you have one hero is dead. Your opponent has five. Granted, some of them are low. But why? Like, you can't just let it leash. They would have wasted the time and then would have gotten anything out of it. Now you ha you're cursed because you can't react to the tribute. You have a boss going up against you. Honestly, Samuro dying was rough, but that move of Chogal seemed a little bit unnecessary. Chogal is back. His death timer is halved, so he's in a great spot. But they are now taking damage at the top keep. They're going to use the keep at the bottom of the map. Cure is even alive. I don't know how. He had negative hit points for a moment. Or that's what it seemed like. They're going for more kills here. Chogal is forcing them back, but they're losing way too much ground. That's at least two keeps that are gone. This one is also going to fall. And again, this was unnecessary. Samura would have been back in time, I think, to at least fight for the tribute. You might still lose it, but you would have had a chance. Now, on the other hand, it seems like we're going to get a victory for the Svenskas because they're just murdering the core. Everything looked all right. And then the kill against Samura, the, that was the first blow. In addition to that, Shogal dying, and it's just too much. That's game. That's a 2-0 victory for the Svenskas against the Cats, everybody. Big W, GG, well played, and the Svenskas move to the winner's match.